This video was sponsored by Brilliant. Hey, happy Friday. This week, Samsung announced their DIY repair program. AMD beat up on poor old Intel again, and two nanometer chips might be coming from the US and Japanese governments. Maybe. Welcome to the Friday checkout. Okay, my release highlights this week start with the OnePlus 10T, which goes back to OnePlus Basics with the fastest chip available in the Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1, a lower $650 price tag, 150 watt fast charging, a nice flat display, but middling cameras and no IP ratings except in the US. Feels like all the old school OnePlus flagship killer strengths and weaknesses are present, though you are of course losing the alert slider and some of the Oxygen OS software magic. Not great, but also not terrible I guess. Also this week, Insta360 released The Link, one of the most advanced webcams available, which is a cool little tool for capturing a moving subject with a 3-axis gimbal camera for streaming and doing video calls. It can respond to hand gestures to zoom or change modes, and it has a privacy mode where the camera automatically points down after 10 seconds of inactivity, which is pretty cool, but it's not cheap at $300. And software news, if you remember that, got its first update in nearly four years this week, with lots of new stuff for you people who still play local music a lot. And two more fun pieces of news this week, both Pokemon related, are that the Rotom phone in Pokemon also got updated and it now has a second camera, very trendy, and possibly even more important is that we now also got Fido, a new Pokemon made out of uncooked bread, a very good boy who apparently breathes yeast. Wow. Did you need to know about Fido? Definitely not, but I definitely needed to tell you about Fido. Just look at the guy. Sadly, we also have a non-release this week, which is Motorola weirdly cancelling the launch of the Razer 3 and the X30 Pro. It was meant to go down on the 2nd of August in China, but was cancelled via a short Weibo post without the company offering any reason, weirdly. And that happened even though the unfolded main display of the 3rd gen Razer had already been posted. Sadly, I've also heard from a couple of little birds that Motorola won't even release the Razer 3 outside of China for now either, which would definitely make make me very unhappy. Okay, and for my first story of the week, Samsung has finally launched their DIY repair program for their phones and tablets via iFixit. So just like Google and Valve did with iFixit, and Apple did with its slightly weird and heavy third-party system for DIY repairs, Samsung is now offering parts and guides for fixing your phone yourself as well. Now it's live, and early on it's pretty much exactly like the Google iFixit setup, except Samsung's offer has even more limitations. Parts are only available for the S20 and S20 series and the Tab S7 Plus, so not even the S22 or the Tab S8 series from this year, let alone the A series or any of the other like 40 or so devices that Samsung releases every year. Even worse, the available parts only include the back glass, charging port, and a combination of display assembly, which is a screen, a metal frame, a bezel, and battery. That's a pretty small selection even compared to Google and Apple, and I think it means that in its current form, you can't just replace a battery or a screen with the program, you'd have to swap out the whole module. And yet another curious limitation, for now at least, is that these Samsung Galaxy genuine parts are only available in the US, though the wording there specifically says we're working towards more devices and additional comprehensive parts. Google's program with iFixit is available in the US, the EU, Canada and Australia, so somehow weirdly Google managed to become less limited in their distribution for once than Samsung, and the whole Samsung program just feels weirdly limited. Anyway, like with the other programs, I'll say that this is early days, so I won't be too harsh on them yet, and it's still a step into the right direction. And another small good news is that Samsung will start selling parts and iFixit tools in its retail locations as well, and they clearly claim that they will expand further in the future as well. Let's wait and see. And then also on the repairs front is another good idea from Samsung, which is called Repair Mode. This only works in Korea so far and only on the S21, but hopefully it will be rolling out further. And the idea is that when sending your phone off to a technician for a fix, you can put it in a specific mode that locks the data, the images, the messages, 
pages, accounts, and so on, while still allowing access to the phone for camera testing and connectivity checks and so on. That's pretty cool. Okay, and my second story of the week is going to be a short one showing just how badly AMD is eating Intel's lunch. So we've already mentioned last week what a disastrous quarter Intel had with sales down for both chips in PCs and data centers because of what the company said was difficult market conditions and the company spending enormous amounts of money on building out their new contract manufacturing business under their new CEO as well. But this week AMD also announced their earnings and things are looking pretty incredible for them. AMD's last quarter beat expectations overall with revenues rising by 70% and sales for them are up in all of the categories including PCs but also server processors where they managed an incredible 83% growth year over year. For comparison Intel's data center and AI group was down 16% in the same period which is not exactly shocking given that their next generation Sapphire Rapids Xeon processors keep suffering delays even as their consumer 12th generation processors seem to do better. Now to be clear some of the growth for AMD was the result of the fact that they brought Zilinx the programmable chip maker not just organic growth, so the company added some revenue there, but Zilinx competes with Intel as well, so it's all the same thing in the end anyway. With a slowing PC market, AMD has downgraded its own forecast a little bit for the quarter ahead too, but what we can take away here is that Intel's problems aren't really just general slowdowns or ARM wiping the floor with x86, but also just Intel performing poorly in general, and I guess they will have an enormous challenge competing against TSMC in chip manufacturing soon as well. And related to that, my third story of the week is going to be a strange chip-related headline that really caught my attention. The US and Japan are apparently working together to develop leading-edge 2 nanometer chip-making processes, with reports saying that the state-led research should specifically bring results by 2025, a very aggressive timeline, and that the goal is to, quote, prevent over-reliance on TSMC's factories in Taiwan to reduce geopolitical risks. That's a very ambitious target, but let's take a look at the details first. So the report says that a US-Japan Economic Policy Consultative Committee has been established by none other than US Secretary of State and Secretary of Commerce, as well as Japan's Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Economy in Washington, so it's pretty top-ranking and very high-level stuff. And the main decision that we know of so far is that Japan will open an R&D center for next generation 2 nanometer chips by year end under a partnership with the US. There are very few details beyond that so far, but this is of course in addition to the US planning a national semiconductor technology center of their own as well, plus all the billions of dollars in spending that they have approved through the CHIPS Act. Now we don't know who will do the actual manufacturing itself, I mean Japan doesn't really have any high-end foundries and the US is a couple of generations behind as well, so it's a little bit unclear whether they will upgrade an existing foundry from somebody like Intel or if the two governments plan to build a foundry of their own, which would be pretty bizarre. Either way, TSMC is planning two nanometer chips for 2025 as well, but they are already building factories for it, and they also spend a casual 40 billion dollars or so on capital expenditures every year, which is like more than half the whole US plans to spend on its CHIPS Act over 10 years, so I find it a little bit hard to imagine that any state-run program or even a private company except for maybe Samsung could catch up with them by 2025. But you know, we're early on and we're a little light on the details, so it's unclear what these governments actually plan to achieve, but one thing that we do know is that whatever they do, they're gonna need a ton of really highly skilled engineers. And the best way to pick up engineering skills for yourself in high demand professions like computer memory, machine learning, or quantum computing is through my sponsor Brilliant. Brilliant's courses are crafted by award-winning teachers, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Microsoft, Google, and more, and they cover topics from beginner to advanced levels. The helpful thing about all of the Brilliant courses is that they are super interactive and well-structured. Courses help you learn by breaking down complicated concepts into small chunks, and then you do an exercise after each one, so you practice what was just explained right away. That ends up building a deeper understanding versus just listening to someone explain a concept without engaging with it. This way you can get better at your job or get a new job altogether or just learn something to be smarter. You can try Brilliant for free using brilliant.org slash TFC and the first 200 people who sign up using that link will also get 20% off their annual premium subscription. So check them out, happy learning and I'll see you next week.